Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the April edition of Loop Live. My name is Josh Gallagher, and I'm really pleased to be back to unpack the now and next in media and marketing. Last time I was with you, we spoke a lot about social commerce. It's really a new moment in marketing that's allowing brands to access a form of shopping that has enabled 1.7 billion people across Asia to turn their brand curiosity into reality. And that's all enabled by a peer-to-peer -peer path to purchase. What happened last month was our Loop Live Insiders gave us some key action points in how to operate in that new social commerce ecosystem. We started by understanding audiences and the ability to seed relevant products into the feed. And we do this by starting with the power of cultural influences and then activating full funnel on scale platform solutions. But let's now draw our attention to today. Today, we're here to talk to you about attention and about paying for quality time, predominantly across screen formats. In the last 12 months, attention has dominated headlines in some of those more regular formats that we've been talking about, those screens that dominate people's viewing time. New researchers, emerging ad tech companies, and old agencies like ours are now claiming to have uncovered the secret source behind attention and paying for quality time. But the question we asked when we first went into this is, is adding a yet another metric into our system useful or useless? We know media fragmentation should mean that we're aiming to consolidate metrics that have the power to bridge the gap between strategy and tactics assist media choices across platform and measure media and message together. The while helping identify contextual fits in a soon to be cookie-less world. So we're gonna talk about attention and we're gonna talk about some of those things today, but it's not another effectiveness measure. We're not claiming that it's, and I don't think anyone should be claiming that it is another measure for success, but there definitely is place to start thinking about a quality filter, to start to overcome that attention deficit that we're seeing from, from consumers, but also reflect the complexity and scale of modern marketing. Today, I'm gonna to be joined by some of those insiders. Nick's gonna join us from our regional team. Nick's our planning lean for the region and will ground us in the reality of all of the noise surrounding this topic. John from Group M APAC will join us to shed light on some of the methodologies at play for this new planning, activation and measurement approach. And we welcome Avril from our team in India that it will take kind of some of that theory into action by understanding how all of it will be implemented in your market. They'll then join me to talk about quality media and answer any of your questions. So if you do have questions and comments along the way, just place them in the comments section um, of the event, and hopefully we'll get some time to cover them off at the end. So let's get into it. Let's set the scene on attention so that we are all in the loop. People are now exposed to over 6,500 brand messages a day. No wonder attention spans have reduced to just eight seconds. In a world where every second counts, attention is the new currency. Planning for attention has reached a tipping point Consumers have shifted 20% more of their time to new video viewing platforms in the last 12 months. While consumers have shifted their habits, marketers have not. Media channels are still being planned in silos. It is not just about industry standards. Attention impressions have been seen to drive brand uplifts of 180% over traditional viewability. Planning for attention starts with understanding the elements that make up quality time. Screen space, or size of the ad relative to the screen. Screen time, or the length of time the ad is viewed for. Content quality, or the distinctiveness of the asset. And finally, content length, or the length of the ad. Getting this wrong can see brands paying over 21 times the cost for low attention ad formats. Paying for quality time helps in overcoming the attention deficit. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Jones. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about attention. So 
There's been a lot of discussion in the industry, as Josh mentioned, in the past 12 months around the attention economy. Uh, I guess the premise of this is that wealth of information that invades people's lives essentially creates a poverty of attention. Now, that's no more true than it is today. Uh, consumers are exposed to over 6,500 branded messages every single day. And this is resulting in a massive reduction of attention spans down to around eight seconds. Now, the pandemic has only exacerbated this trend with 86% of people consuming more media than previously. And with all this noise and clutter, there's never been a greater need to understand the true value of an impression. Attention solutions have the potential to solve this issue across a few areas. Firstly, media to provide a unified metric across channels. Secondly, to determine the impact and distinctiveness of a creative asset. And finally, understanding the importance of context and environment in, an, in the future cookie-less world. Now, ultimately, the potential value of attention is breaking down some of these silos that exist in the industry as a whole. So not only are more people spending time with media, they're doing so across more platforms than ever before, from linear TV to video sharing and streaming platforms like connected TV. While consumers have shifted their habits, marketers generally have not. TV spots are still planned on reach or cost per writing point. OTT is planned on a cost per reach basis, while video on shared platforms like YouTube can be assessed on a range of metrics from CPM to cost per completed view. These are all far from ideal effectiveness proxies and ones built on an opportunity rather than a certainty of being seen. A reach point or an impression is only as valuable if someone is actually paying attention. So to be able to turn this from a marketing theory into action, we do need a common metric to be able to plan media across platforms. Planning for quality attention means understanding when an ad is viewed, um, the amount of time that is spent viewing, the context is viewed in, and also the quality of the content. Ultimately, the greater the amount of consumer attention your communication gets, the greater likelihood you'll shift brand KPIs, says the research. And viewability alone is not enough. And attention optimization has been seen to deliver over 180% greater ROI from a Nielsen study than viewability alone. So there are several factors that contribute to attention, which we've grouped into what we're calling a quality quadrant, which you can see here. Firstly, screen space. In other words, the size of an ad relevant to the size of the screen. So the larger the size, the less clutter there is with fewer elements competing for that valuable attention. Secondly, content quality. So understanding the distinctive elements of an asset that drive quality. Now, these could be anything from logos to pack shots, colors, etc., or even if, even if it was played with sound on or off. Thirdly, screen time. So the average length of time that the ad has been on the screen. And finally, content length. So the length of the content generally influences the distinctiveness of that asset. Now, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to go into the different methods of attention tracking. Thank you, Nick. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the methodologies behind the attention tracking um, partners and uh, vendors. There's obviously a lot of vendors out there that are measuring attention. And as Josh and Nick mentioned, it's become a very kind of popular buzzword in the industry. But I'm going to try and give you some practical um, ways to decide who you think the best attention partner are for your client. So the first one is camera-based attention, attention uh, vendors. And you may have heard of partners like Adelaide and Amplified Intelligence. And typically what they do is they use the camera within your, typically within your phone to kind of do eye tracking. So what happens is they will have a panel of people, they will recruit them and they will get them to download an app. And within that application, in that application, it will access your um, camera within your phone and it'll use that camera to sort of track you across how you observe ads. And this particular methodology has pros and cons to it, like anything. Like I said, it's the pros are it's, it's genuine eye tracking. So it follows your eyes um, across the screen and what they do. It does help understand subconscious browsing behavior as well, helps you understand 
where you're where you're naturally drawn to, what parts of the screen you're naturally drawn to. And it's really, really good for creative testing, um, ability to test formats and different executions in a controlled environment. And overall, this is really been, think of this as like a sort of, ex, as a giant laboratory for experimenting and looking at things because you've got recruited a panel and you're able to track them in really, really granular detail in terms of what they do and how they, how they sort of read and look at ads. And there are a couple of cons to this methodology. Data is not collected in real time during the campaign. So typically you have to wait till the end of a campaign to get your to get the learnings from it. So you can't make um, tweaks on the hop. And um, like I said before, it's based on panel-based data. So with all panel-based data, it needs to be extrapolated. And when it comes to extrapolating panel-based panel-based information, this is very actually a very specialist um, service, and not all partners do uh, extrapolation in the correct way and methodology. I mentioned here panel size. Um, recruitment can be small sometimes. And I think something other within panels is really important to mention. It needs to be a proper representation of the population. And sometimes online app-based panels aren't that. And the final point is here is just, yeah, they all vary uh, sizes and small. And like I said to you, um, not all of them are a fair representation of the population and sometimes can lead to slightly inflated numbers. Next slide, please, Nick. Other ones um, for, tr for tracking attention, what we've called here, which is called advanced viewability. And I think we've all heard about viewability and how to measure it, but we can sort of look at metrics when we call it advanced viewability. And this is simple tracking through ad tags. And typical companies that would do this would be things like Double Verify, Moat, Oracle. And it's a very, very simple implementation. You place a tag within your creative, and these vendors are able to send you back a bunch of um, data points on attention. Um, examples here, AVOC, which is audio visual on completion, time on screen, player size, um, and these are in real time. So the pros of this are, okay, like unlike panel, it's real time. So you're able to make optimizations on the hoof. Um, mostly universally accepted and agreed measurement parameters for each metrics like viewability. Um, without going into too much detail, these type of vendors tend to go to the MRC globally and get accreditation for their different methodologies which just puts a rubber stamp um, of what they call integrity and in how they measure things. Um, what I think is really important, these can be sim really simply measured through through existing ad tags. It's not hard to implement an ad tag um, within a certain creative, working much, much harder to stand up some of the eye tracking. Um, and it's auditable through the log files, um, which I think is really, really important. So we can collect the log files of all the impression data and go through all different metrics and really get some really, really interesting insights into what's working and what's not. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of features. Next slide, please, Nick. And I thought uh, this was a really interesting chart that uh, would help me tell, tell you what different platforms measure um, and what, more importantly, what they allow you to measure. So what you can see here is a sort of table and down the side are all the different metrics that you could measure from some of the um, tag-based verification vendors like Screen Real Estate, like uh, Completion, um, AVOC, which you mentioned. And along the top, you have all the different platforms. You've obviously got third-party ad server platforms like OTT, but obviously TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And I think the really interesting thing here is, is that uh, whenever we're able to work in the open internet, when we work with you know, publishers and broadcasters, because we third party ad serve things, that gives us the ability to track pretty much everything when it comes to attention. What I think is really, really interesting is some of the platforms actually hold back some of the attention uh, metrics that we can measure. And the cynic in me and say they hold those back because they know they perform badly. Um, but what you'll see here is just what the, what the different coverage of different metrics is by platforms. And the key insight here is it's pretty much impossible to get a common view of attention, um, a common single metric of attention across all vendors because some of them hold hold, up, hold back certain metrics. So that can make it quite difficult sometimes to get an apples for apples comparison. Thanks, John. So we've, we've looked into why we should look at attention um, and what attention is, as well as the different methodologies and opportunities to, to track attention. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the implications for, for planning. Now, 
The real implication of all of this for channel planning is that we should be factoring in the impact of a media channel across more than just reach and cost and really prioritize channels with the greatest potential of attention per dollar spent. Now, in the middle, you can see that different channels yield different amounts of attention. What we see is that more impactful video formats, as an example, and channels that deliver far higher levels of attention than static or display. Now, there are a few factors that contribute this, which we which we called out earlier in the quality quadrant piece, but these can be anything of ranging from active to passive consumption um, of that device and that content. It could be the specific device and screen size. It could be the amount of screen real estate and clutter that's associated with that. And it can also be the premium or non-premiumness uh, of the environment, as well as the length of copy. Now, you can see in the middle here that the average eyes on dwell time um, ranges quite drastically from channel to channel with a 30 second TV copy on the far left, delivering far greater attention than mobile display, for example. Now, I think where it gets interesting is where you overlay the channel CPM against this. Um, and you can see, I guess, the true cost um, of attention. So the implication here is that the CPM is, is overlaid. And when we factor in the cost of attention, there are some pretty significant differences. So the chart on the right overlays the CPM until you get an, an ACPM or an attention CPM. And you'll see that traditionally cost-effective reach drivers like display, for example, can in this sense be up to 22 times more expensive for the same level of attention, which is quite stark given the implications for an industry which largely plans on a cost per reach basis. Now, we'd like to show you a couple of examples about how brands are testing attention to impact their brand planning. Freedom! But now Minaj has ignited a firestorm for spreading vaccine misinformation. This is outrageous. This election was a fraud. The rise of disinformation online. Research shows that news brands are 3.5 times more trusted than other sources of online information. And as global advertising has increased by 81% in the last decade, advertising revenues for news brands has decreased by 82%, casting a shadow over the future of journalism. As one of the world's largest advertisers, Coca-Cola created a new media buying algorithm that improves advertising outcomes and delivers up to seven times more revenue for news brands. We did this by partnering with tech company Adelaide, implementing eye tracking technology and AI to measure contextual signals, such as the credibility of environment, and score it with the new metric, attention units. This change was deployed in two phases. First, we A-B tested our campaign, optimizing half of our ads for viewability and the other half for attention units. This was followed by a small scale test with Coke brand Aquarius Water, where attention optimization delivered a significantly higher brand recall. We then launched our big scale campaign for Coke Zero across multiple markets, which in turn delivered further increased results for our attention metric. Our new formula was a huge success, delivering a 16% increase in ad recall, a 36% increase in ad impact, up to seven times more impressions across news brands. Coca-Cola has since made the algorithm available for all advertisers to not only drive better business outcomes, but to benefit journalism and society as a whole. So another great example about how optimizing for attention can deliver better brand results is a campaign we ran for Skoda electric vehicles in Switzerland. Now, the electronic vehicle category um, is highly competitive and brands in that space generally plan to share a voice parity um, and operate on a, on a max reach principle. Our challenge was to go beyond these so-called optimum levels of reach and frequency by testing the impact of advertising in relevant environments and formats. These, the hypothesis was that greater relevance through premium placements would deliver more attention and a greater impact on the overall brand metrics, whether that is ad recall, ad impact, or purchase intent. To evaluate which placements got more attention, we partnered with Adelaide that applied eye tracking uh, and to assign every impression with, with essentially uh, an attention unit score. 
This was combined with a, a brand lift study to understand a couple of things. Number one, does optimizing for attention deliver better results than optimizing for viewability? And secondly, do premium environments or PMP deals deliver better results than open marketplace? So the results showed that attention optimization delivered 16% higher ad recall, 5% higher impact, and 12% higher purchase intent compared to viewability, similar to the Coke example that you just saw. Additionally, the PMP inventory delivered 6% higher ad recall, 32% higher impact, and 29% higher purchase intent compared to um, the open marketplace test. So these results, had, like Coca-Cola, had led to a shift for a shift of the brand to focus on assessing attention per media dollar spent rather than just a pure reach conversation. So now Avril is gonna to touch on to how we've been looking at attention from an Indian market perspective. Thanks, Nick. I think what's absolutely fascinating about attention is how universal this topic is. And when we heard about it, there was immediate resonance for us here in India. So what I really talk you through is how we went about building a use case for attention planning with one of our key clients and really what's gone into the building blocks of uh, putting a pilot together. Uh, firstly, when it comes to the context, I think India as a market has always been a very heavy linear TV market. And uh, with, you know, uh, time spent as much as three hours uh, on television alone. Over the last few years, we've seen uh, with the data boom, smartphones entering households, connected TVs entering households. And it was really over the last two years, uh, over the course of the pandemic, where all of this accelerated. But what was really amazing is that nothing really gave me. TV time spent continued to be the three hours plus that we saw previous to the pandemic. And then all of these other media just got added to it. So there was a lot of second screening happening. There were new day parks that opened in terms of uh, watching OTT content or watching uh, uh, programming while in transit media and so on. So we were right at the tipping point where marketers were asking a very valid question that if my viewership has now fragmented across so many different platforms and day parts, then where do I find my most attentive audience? Or where is it that I'm you know, really going to get the best bang for my buck? Uh, that's really where we introduce attention planning to them. And if you move to the next slide, uh, Nick, just talking through how we went about the building blocks of it. So this is a large MNC client with a portfolio of brands. And uh, here we've really tried to stay true to uh, what attention planning in principle is, which is bringing in quality metrics into planning, as well as organizing the, uh, the field work and the design in such a way that it makes sense for a heterogeneous market like India. So a couple of considerations to keep in mind. The first is to begin as a pilot because there is a lot of newness to this space. There are a lot of metrics that we're used to and we're introducing attention as a unifier metric across different platforms, across media and creative. So important to pilot it and build comfort with the client. So we selected a market which was isolatable as well as important to the business. Uh, we've gone about then uh, identifying what are the touch points within that market that we need to look at and what is the right sample size that we need. Uh, we are, here we're staying true to a lot of research basics. We know what are the typical sample sizes in a market, what are the quotas that's needed, and that's how we've gone about building it. Uh, we've, uh, we have around 150 to 200 respondents per week that we're planning for in order to get the attention metrics. And right now we're going across linear television and OTT as well as uh, social platforms. So those are the three uh, touch points that we've selected. When it comes to looking at partners, it is still a work in progress. I think uh, here, as, as mentioned by uh, Nick and John earlier, uh, various pros and cons through panel-based methodology or through you know going and recruiting new households, we're evaluating both at the moment. Um, I think at all times, it's important to be very respectful of the process and, have, and work with a very accredited uh, partner because it's a new space and we need to ensure that all the right norms in terms of privacy, get data collection, et cetera, are followed. But what's very important uh, in our discussion with client was what's going to be the outcome here, right? And there are three large outcomes that we are looking at from an India perspective. I think the first one is really on uh, helping us identify the difference between a viewership or a viewability-based plan and an attention-based plan. For instance, take something like cricket. It's extremely expensive in our market to be on cricket, but uh, really we don't have the holy grail answer to, you know, people are watching cricket content, but are they also paying attention to the ads on cricket? So that's one thing that we're hoping to be able to answer from this study. The second is in terms of creative uh, 
effectiveness. I think, again, the opportunity to see if the same creative is run on linear television, on OTT, uh, and on a social platform, or if there are different creators, what's really the upside that we can quantify and prove to our client. And the third is in terms of brand outcomes. And here, again, it's important to uh, not just rely on outside tracks, but to build that in within your attention planning design, where you're able to say that day parts or audiences with higher attention, what was their resultant message cut through or purchase intent, and is there a significant delta? So yeah, it, there's a lot of learning and a lot of back and forth and iterations that have happened, but it's an exciting space. And I think clients are definitely uh, at a place where they're asking these questions and it's, it's, it's great to be able to offer them solutions. Uh, moving on, I think, um, yeah, just summarizing what are some of the key takeaways that we've heard today uh, across uh, Nick, John and myself. I think, uh, again, reiterating that uh, it does it, there does seem to be a tipping point in the market where marketers are looking at us for these answers. Consumers are fragmented across various touch points and attention is emerging as a unifier across a lot of these questions and platforms. Uh, when it comes to talking about attention, I think it's very important to say what it is and what it's not. So it's definitely a step up from viewability or viewership metrics, and it's important to keep emphasizing the quality aspect of it. There are so many use cases, I think, uh, you know, whether it is around when fragmentation is an issue, when quality of creatives is an issue, when allocation of uh, money is an issue. I think uh, we've been able to build out a lot of case studies. And with each of these use cases, we see the client getting more and more interested. So I think it, it is just about putting on our planner hats and really looking at what are the nuanced case studies we can build out. And uh, lastly, as I mentioned, important for us to identify the right partners, again, work with those who have the right benchmarks, the right methodologies in place, and also work on pilots so that we build and learn. So yeah, interesting times ahead. And uh, I'm sure a lot of questions as well. So I'll hand over Josh, uh, hand it over to Josh to now open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thanks, Avril. Um, so uh, th there are some questions, um, <clears throat> and I do have a, a whole heap of questions. Um, that I want to ask as well. There was there was a specific question from um, Joanna um, that maybe I'll comment on because it's a nice segue into into the first question. Um, and the question, if if I read it, was: Have we found any links between attention and BLS results? So brand lift studies um, like ad recall, awareness lift, for example. Um, so I think it's a really good question. I think it's a good question because it opens opens up the conversation, particularly around attention and and where we're starting to see the potential. Um, of attention. It's not just in being a metric that can be used for one platform. Um, so if we've got a brand new study on a, a Facebook or a YouTube, but a way to start to think about how we solve attention um, across different platforms and across screens, um, because I think that's one of the big areas where um, brands are really starting to have, a, have to have a think about that in, in markets where you have multiple versions of an, an ad going across TV, OTT, um, that will, Avril will be experiencing in India and CTV, but then also on your YouTubes, Facebooks and, and the other platforms as well. So I think my, my first question for Nick then is that, you know, br brands are really facing challenges with the amount of time spent across screens um, to effectively plan how they do that. So when we talk about media mix plan, but also measuring media media campaigns. So what's your view, I suppose, as one of the experts on, on this new metric going some way to start to solve this? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, um, you know, I think like you've you touched on to the point that we made earlier, which is there's kind of a greater proliferation of screens, channels, opportunities to advertise, which is great. Right? But fundamentally, it's not a simple process when you're planning, buying and measuring them. Ultimately, each of these channels are bought and planned slightly differently with, with different buying models, different metrics to track, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this attention does go some way in providing a unified metric that not only is the same for online channels, but also works for offline channels as well. Because uh, a lot of our conversations are how we can homogenize digital KPIs. But I think bringing that to a multi-screen approach, having looking at TV as well, is really important and i think you know going beyond viewability to understand how long people are viewing content for and what level of attention they're paying for that is a much better proxy than i guess what we're doing previously i don't think it needs to stop there though because i don't i think it still is a proxy for effectiveness and it doesn't go all the way to really understand the true resonance of communication um and that needs to really ladder up to to brand results 
Cool. Good answer. Um, so I think I've got another question that I've seen come in, which is very similar. I think Vivek is actually looking at my my ordering of questions as well. So Vivek's asked around partners that are currently able to track and optimize for attention. Um, and I suppose my, my question for John, and, and there, there is some work that's been done within the full white paper around the types of partners that we can use um, within here. Um, but I suppose, John, when, when assessing some of those providers for attention, what kind of parameters are you looking for within their product? Because there's a, a, probably a lot of variance in here because it's a relatively new measure. Um, and then I suppose the follow up to that, what kind of influence do things like market coverage have? The platform coverage, so I spoke a little bit before around whether it's you know TV versus OTT or, or other video formats, um, and then the type of methodology as well. All right, so I'll, I'll try to give you a slightly a practical answer, slightly boring, but I'll give you a practical answer to this question. The, the first thing that if, if anyone on this call, if an attention provider contacts you, the first thing I would say to them is like, meet me face to face and draw on a whiteboard your calculation for attention. And I would say that uh, eight out of 10 will drop out of the race just by the fact that they can't write down the calculation for attention. You'd be surprised how many of them will talk about the fact that it's um, it's uh, proprietary, um, some sort of proprietary data set they can't share with you. So anyone that can't really explain to me the calculation, kind of I immediately go, well, it's probably not someone we'd like to work with. And um, once they can give me that answer, I kind of then go into two ways. If it's a panel-based sort of measurement one, like an amplified intelligence, I typically will ask them, well, how big is your panel? And is it a fair representation of the country? Um, if it's a verification provider, I typically will go um, where your servers where your server's allocated, and you can sort of go through this hierarchy and you can come down to it. And then you get down to the sort of question is, how much do you cost? And do you have local boots on the ground to help our local teams execute on these things? And I think if you go through this kind of like sort of decision tree of questions, you'll probably not out of one or two vendors that will sort of fit your needs. And I would sort of say that if you go through those questions, I think that for most people, and I say the word most, some of the, Ad tag verification vendors like Double Verify and Moot will solve most of your needs. Um, things like the Moot video score are really, really good for measuring attention. Obviously, there's more bespoke stuff, but I'd always encourage people to go through a decision tree of questions when speaking to about people about attention. So when you whittle it down, you might find that effort isn't necessarily worth the reward. Cool. So that uh, that leads into maybe my next question. Um, around media cost. It's all about value at the end of the day. Um, so some of it's about effectiveness, but some of it's about about value and, and cost. Um, Nick spoke a little bit around, you know, the how we can start to relook at costs um, of media in there. Um, do you think we're at a stage yet where we can call this a new currency for, for media costs, or do you think that's a, a, a stretch in, in some ways? It's probably a stretch at the minute. I mean, I've seen some examples. I think in the UK, the FT.com started trading on time spent a couple of years ago as a metric. But it's, it's really, really hard to get common consent across like all media partners on what the methodology is and what the currency should be. So I think it'll be more of an optimization um, sort of tweak uh, for us or, a, or an optimization kind of um, way that we can tweak campaigns rather than it being trading out my attention who knows um but i think I, th I think it's more of a, a lever and optimization rather than a media uh, metric for the time being okay cool so then then for nick i suppose how, how do you get started then how it seems like there's a bit of testing involved and and some kind of starting points for a lot of clients how would you recommend if you're kind of new to attention and, and new to a new metric how do you kind of get going on it yeah, I mean, rather predictably, I don't think there is one answer to this. Um, I think it depends on on the category that you operate in. I think it depends on the maturity of your brand. Um, you know, I think a, a performance client, for example, their testing approach or their initial testing approach will be very different from a brand marketer. So I guess from, from a brand perspective, you might want to understand what the different attention levels of attention are to inform your upstream planning. You might want to look into the impact of measuring attention to pre-test creative, for example. Whereas, I guess, on the more performance side, you might want to go deep on one channel like display to see whether, you know, to the example earlier, whether a PMP works better than an open exchange, you know, whether different publishers work better than others on an attention basis. 
you might also want to look at it in terms of optimizing creative on the fly as well. So, yeah, not not a straightforward answer, but uh, there is a spectrum. I don't I don't think there's ever a straightforward from answer from a, a strategy or a planning person. It always starts with it depends. Um, so I've got I've got another question, um, Nick, for you. Um, I suppose around the the quality quadrant, and I suppose that looks like a, a useful way to to kind of get started. There's probably a lot of people. Um, tuning in today or, or read the white paper from different categories. So we've we've seen examples from automotive, um, some examples from beverage brands. Do you think it's going to be even in the way that we would use that and apply that, or do you think different categories are going to operate in different ways? I mean, in terms of maximizing attention, all four elements are important and they will contribute to your brand's attention in some way, shape or form. But I think the, the weightage of each of them, whether it is screen size, whether it is, um, you know, the amount of clutter, whether it is the, the copy length, et cetera, they, they may all have different factor influences on the overall level of attention. So it may be worth just kind of having a hypothesis of what your brand or category um, you know, is largely driven by in terms of effectiveness and start there. Um, because I think there isn't, you know, a uniform percentage of contribution for one of the quadrant areas um, or indeed any of the others. Okay, uh, th uh, there's a couple of questions coming in and they're, they're definitely for the for the attention boffin. So I'm gonna leave that to the end, but th there's one one question that I want to um, ask before we before we get into those and it's around creative and, and content Nick I think you touched on it around resonance and how we can add in that into the mix of, of attention um, Avril in in your experience having having gone through this and, and thought about it a lot how do you see that playing a, a part in, in what we do a lot of the work that's been done currently is around a media metric, um, but we know that media and message work really well together. So what's your perspective on, on eventually being able to add the creative effectiveness kind of part into this? So Josh, I think the right word you've used is eventually, because I think the first conversation is happening on it as a quality metric, as an optimization lever. And it's also whom we're talking to, right? Because initially it is, uh, it and, and these are early days, so it's really going in as a way of, you know, being able to allocate better or invest better, smarter, and so on. Uh, having said that, we shouldn't lose the opportunity to constantly have the conversation on content as well, because uh, th there is the, there is the impact that content brings to the table. It could be a day part which is typically low on attention or a platform which is low on attention, but that's really the part of the creative to really grab the audience and you know get him to have that right time spent on it. So I think it's it's up to us as uh, facilitators in this process to ensure that we keep bringing the content conversation back. I'd be honest, it's not up front and center. I think there uh, the optimization really takes, uh, takes the lead, but it's definitely something that we should get around uh, because without that, it's incomplete. I think uh, we'd be shortchanging ourselves if we just use it as an optimization lever. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to go in order of questions. We've got about five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to be fair to, to those that, that ask questions and, and try and go in an order. Um, there's a question, I'll, I'll point this at you, Nick, um, around um, what is your view on the value of longer periods of tension to ads versus shorter ones? Um, so I, I suppose with it, without us getting into too much academia around passive and active attention and, and those kinds of things, um, the question is around there's research showing that uh, it might take three seconds of attention um, to an ad to, to access long-term memory, yet most of the attention currencies mentioned um, fail to reflect that. So if we're using an ACPM or, or those kinds of things, how are we taking those kinds of areas in, into account in, in what is um, quite a complex field at the moment? Sorry, can you just repeat that last bit? You cut out for a second. Um, so the last bit was there is research showing that it takes about three seconds of attention to an ad for it to access long-term memory, yet most of the attention-based currencies mentioned by you, e.g. an ACPM, fail to reflect that. So what's, what's I mean, the value of longer periods of attention to ads versus shorter ones? I mean, I think the, it stands to reason that the longer that people pay attention to an ad, um, the, the greater the, the resonance with people um, and the ability to recall a message. I think it doesn't have to be one or another. And I think that the fundamentals of, you know, memory retention within within advertising and media still very much apply. I think this is just a, 
an additional layer where you can measure the amount of time that people spend uh, consume, consume content. Um, there is going to be diminishing returns in terms of the amount of time that people are spent watching stuff. So you know, the first few few seconds may be more impactful than the subsequent ones. Um, but I would say yes to both. Sitting on the fence there. Um, so John, I'll, I'll ask you the the, uh, the final question. Um, seems we've only got three minutes left. And I suppose this is a, a specific one in a market and, and perhaps you have some insight here. Um, but I'm really interested in how attention plays out across markets given the different landscapes of, of, of media in there. Uh, and there's one from George um, that says, from an attention perspective, do you believe there is any difference, and if so, what level, between TV and BVOD as platforms when we think about CTV penetration um, across BVOD getting to 80% mark in places like New Zealand? Oh, good question. So basically the question is, do we think that Linear television and Bevo on big TV. Um, is this prop like okay, I don't have any I don't have any evidence to support this, um, apart from the fact that it's a very very similar experience um, in terms of you you know it's a household viewing experience you're seeing from the television. I suspect linear TV and CTV are very similar in terms of the consumer user experience. I guess the only difference that might come through is obviously ad loads are much uh, less on CTV. Whereas, you know, is it 12 minutes? It's 12 minutes per hour. It's 12 minutes per hour on um, linear, or linear TV. It's only a couple of minutes per hour on CTV. Um, and a lot of, for now, until people try to increase those ad loads. So I suspect you've got um, that period where people aren't going off and boiling, boiling the kettle, um, which quite often happens in the linear television experience. So I guess it'd be a really interesting test for some of the offline vendors to understand the linear television experience versus the CTV experience. Hopefully that wasn't sitting on the fence. No, it isn't, but I am going to wrap it up um, with that. I think that's really in interesting. I think the, the one thing for me, um, and although we're, we're talking about this today and we've, and we've put out some material around attention, it is still something that's moving. It's not something that's kind of set in stone at this stage. I think my advice, as always, with these areas uh, for clients is get as much information as you can on, on the subject, um, test, understand the different players. Um, but there is real benefits in, in thinking about a new metric. Uh, and that's what I want to leave with today. I think a new metric helps us with, a, with complexity. I think, as I said at the start, not siloing off different metrics for different platforms, um, but thinking about how we can unify some of those areas um, and test um, the effectiveness of, of being able to do that uh, within, within what we do. So with that, I'm gonna thank everyone. There's a whole heap of questions still there. Please reach out to any of us if you wanna ask and, and follow up those questions and we'll try and follow up um, as we can with those ones. There's a lot of discussion around this topic. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks Nick, John and Avril for giving your expert opinion. And we will see everyone next month with another edition of Loop Live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.